Uh, just a couple announcements here. We have the Lord's Supper today, our communion service after uh, the second service or at the end of the second service. And then we have also a deacon's meeting after the second service. So um, glad to be back with you. We had a, a good little break. And uh, of course, it's always good to be back home, as you know. Uh, so, and I noticed it didn't cool off any since we, uh, <laughs> since we left. <laughs> No, it's not bad. I think we're all kind of getting used to it. No. At least you, you got to work at it, but you got to make it happen. So um, anyways, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and dismiss the children. And here we are to 15 and 16 on religion or Christianity. And of course, our communion service is in the second service. As we just heard, we, we worship in spirit and truth. And uh, God has allowed us the opportunity to um, be filled with the spirit. So we do that through confession or acknowledge of our sins which is a grace gift in, in uh, our view. So let's go ahead and take a moment and acknowledge those sins before God. And I'll pray and we'll get, we'll get going. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for this uh, grace gift that you provide us each and every day to not only uh, receive your word, but also to live it every day. We thank you uh, so much for this life, the, the scripture that you've given us that is completed, and we just pray that we can uh, concentrate today in a way that is uh, life-changing. We thank you so much, and we just ask uh, all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So here we are. It's been a little bit, uh, or it feels like it has. It hadn't been too long, right? Time flies uh, when you're having fun. So just to recall a little bit that uh, if you remember Paul, we were talking about Paul, and uh, we were in the book of Philippians, and he was drawing us a comparison. Remember Paul had been involved deeply uh, with his religious roots, and he was very fond of those religious roots. And he got into explaining the differences between the relational aspect of what he is now into very <laughs> much so, and also the contrast to that of what he used to enjoy, what he used to find um, at the top of his priority list. And, and if you remember that thing, those things have changed and I think part of this had to do with, uh, if you, let me just sh show you the verse, because Paul really defines, I think, uh, Christianity. This is in uh, Philippians 3, and these are the three things that he, he tells us about. I don't know if I have the verse. Here, here's the verse, and the same three things I highlighted. And, you know, this is really the definition of the Christian life in this one verse. If you have to describe, if you have to tell anybody about what it's about, if you have to show them, this is really in a nutshell an overarching view of what we do and how we do it and, and who we do it through. And you can see it's definitely through the Spirit. We worship in the Spirit. Uh, there, that's huge. That is so big. And the reason why Paul calls that out is because this is something he didn't used to do, right? He was not in the Spirit. And there's a, uh, a disconnect there with the Christian life and worshiping in the spirit a lot of cases when, when it comes to churches or religion or just maybe a misunderstanding in this area how sin affects or grieves the spirit. There's not a lot of study. There's not a lot of understanding. There's not a lot of uh, talk around walking in the Spirit and how our sin natures affect that walk. But the reality is we've got to do it in the Spirit because God uh, desires that. Because guess what? That's the only way we can do the second part of this, which is to glorify God in these bodies. These bodies are sinful. If we come to the table with a sinful body and attempt to glorify God in something other than the Holy Spirit, it's not going to live up to the perfect standards that He has, which is perfect righteousness. 
So a uh, big deal. You know, these first two are huge and absolutely necessary, I would say, to do anything that we do in the Christian life. This is every day. And every one of these are every day. And then finally, what, what kind of glues everything together here is not putting confidence in the flesh. What is that? Faith. That, that, that's what faith is. When you're not putting confidence or trusting or uh, leaning on the things you can see, instead you're leaning on God and His Word, that's faith. Because, you, you know, that's belief in the unseen. You're convicted of what you cannot see, and that is the reality of the life you are living. So that's faith. And, and faith is what allows these first two to even be a reality. You realize that? It takes faith to confess your sins. Because you trust the person on the other side of that prayer who has already forgiven and died for uh, those sins and is, and is willing and ready to do that on a daily basis when we sin again, right? So that's what cleansing is all about for the believer. So if we don't have faith in the object, how are we going to worship in the Spirit? How are we going to worship at all? Uh, how are we going to glorify God without faith? It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible. And I'll tell you, you know, we've got a lot of glorification going on today, but it's, it's uh, there's a difference between glorifying God and glorifying man. One puts faith in the object. One puts faith in, in himself, which is, uh, you know, the flesh. So we can't, we've got to be able to distinguish between the two types of worship that we've kind of been studying all along kind of this study is there is a fleshly worship of God, I guess we could say, and a spiritual and, and powerful worship of God that is meaningful and convicting. So uh, putting no confidence in the flesh kind of calls out that aspect because this is what Paul did. And, you know, we at the same time, we go back and forth with putting confidence in the flesh. We can't do this 100%. We can't glorify God and worship in the Spirit and put no confidence in the flesh 100%. Just because we're believers uh, doesn't mean this is automatic and 100% of the time. No, the sin nature has to be calculated into this equation. And when it is, we can really make a mess out of these three things right here. Really make a mess out of them. Or what we can do, I think, more subtly is to mimic them, mimic them. And that's what we see a lot of. We see a lot of mimicking worship in the Spirit of God through emotion. It appears to be very spiritual, and it appears to be maybe something that is uh, a deeply part of that person's life. But the reality is... Is that really what's taking place? Are those sins, have those sins been cleansed or are they out of fellowship with unconfessed sin with a bunch of emotion? That's the question I can't answer, but each individual person can, right? And so we've got to realize that each one of these are not only uh, falsely mimicked, but there is a correct way and a wrong way to do everything. I mean, isn't that why Satan partly uh, is here, is to uh, deceive, to uh, take God's Word and twist it and change it, and to put out a false alternative so we can say, well, that looks very, very similar. It looks very, very close, but wait a minute. How are you going to know that if you don't have the truth to discern it? We can't. We'll just say that's it. That's the one. That's right. Right? And then we'll accept it. We, we can't accept it. We can't accept the lie. We can't accept anything that is a, in opposition to the Word of God. But we will if we don't know or we can't recognize what we're looking at. So the only way to do that is to do what you're doing right now, is to study. Study the Word um, in, in the Spirit, of course. So this is... Christianity in this verse, and, and, and that's why I like it. And I'll say biblical, biblical Christianity because, you know, if we don't put the Bible first in our relationship with God, what do we put first? 
There's a lot of things we can put first. But if we don't put the Bible first, we can't define the Christian way of life. We can't do it. We can attempt to do it. We can say, well, this person sets a good example of that, or, or, or in my mind they set a good example of that, and I'm going to follow them. But the reality is you don't know accuracy unless you have the absolute standard of the Word of God. Because, you know, we do and, and sometimes don't set the example from the Word of God. Paul did, right? And he, he knew that believers... Uh, uh, should at least follow the example that he was setting. He was confident in that. It wasn't arrogant. It wasn't boastful. He was just in a place in his life where he was ultimately setting a sacrifice and a precedent to live serving the Lord. And he wasn't afraid to say, hey, look at my example. He's not saying it's easy. He's not saying it's, it's glorious living, look at me, hey, I'm dancing around the stage. He's saying, no, I'm looking to God and the Word, and I'm living that in my life, and see, now look at that example. So it's almost indirectly, he's saying, look at my example, but what is he really pointing to? He's pointing to truth. He's pointing to everything that he's gathering from the Word of God. So in order to say, look at my example, and have it basically go straight to God, you know, the redirection, say, if you're looking at someone and that person is walking the line when it comes to the spiritual life, who is that glorifying? It's certainly not glorifying the person. It's glorifying God to, to, to look at someone and say, wow, you know, they are really not doing this for their own interest. This is not what this is about. This is for serving the Lord, serving God. So, um, so these three are, are good to keep in mind. And, you know, there's so many standards uh, today, and that's why I feel this is so important, because so many people have standards, and, and where they get those standards from are from many places, hopefully a good place. Uh, but it starts with parents, right? And then all of a sudden when we leave the house, we start getting input from all kinds of other places. And it molds our standard of who we are as people. So what you see today is a lot of things that we think or they think are right, but it's absolutely detached from the one standard that we should all follow and look to on how to live our life. So uh, anyways, this is, this is a big topic, but... One thing that is different between these standards and the standards of today is that these don't change. Standards today shift. They shift with the wind. When the weather's hot, the standards change. God's standards don't change. They're absolute. The integrity of God, His moral aspect of Him, His divine integrity never changes. His personality never changes. Uh, his attributes that we've studied don't change. Uh, so we have this as, I think that's a, a place of confidence. You know, there's nothing or no one in this world that you can look to and completely 100% rely on because of our imperfect nature. And that's, you know, that's just part of life. We understand that. But look, we do have someone that we can look to 100% of the time that is confident and that is faithful towards us. Uh, so at least faithful, right? We, we can't always say he's confident because we do have a sin nature and we do fail. But he has, uh, uh, he is confident, or excuse me, he is faithful to us. So he's always there waiting and willing, but we're the ones that must take the reins and make right decisions. Uh, versus wrong decisions. And it always goes kind of back down to those, to that granular level, right? So, so this never changes. So, uh, so this kind of living has to take a, a high place in your standard. Um, another area of emphasis that Paul included here was Jesus Christ. He really focused on Christ as we were going through those verses. That's kind of the epitome of the Christian life, Jesus Christ. That's what we stand for. 
well, that's what we believe in to enter into this relationship. That's our example. That's who we serve. That's whose word we receive. That's whose mind we, we become to think with. Jesus Christ is everything. It's not just one aspect of his life. It's in his entire life. And when you think about the word and how the word of God is definitely centered on Christ, Old and New Testament, Christ centered, looking forward all the way back to when man fell and prophesied then all the way through uh, the end of the Bible. So if it's centered in the Bible, it's also centered for our lives. Jesus Christ is and should be the center of every Christian's life uh, that is a Christian. So, uh, so it's his mind that we studied and what Paul did in Philippians 3, remember he, he was warning them. He was warning them because they were associated, affiliated with, uh, immersed in this kind of atmosphere that Paul had already been a part of. So he was warning them about the same exact thing that you and I deal with. You, and I, you don't realize that you deal with these things more uh, than you really think you do. But we're just so used to it. You're so used to it. When it comes to the family, the friends, now we're in a position where we kind of just blow it off. Right? Because we hear it so much, it, it almost comes in one ear or out the other because these things are almost standards to people and it's detached from the Word. And I think part of that is you have to realize your place. You have to realize your place. You know, you, we don't want to preach to people when they don't want to be preached to. We don't want to teach people if they don't want to be taught. Right? We don't want to turn them off. But at the same time, there comes a time when something needs to be said and there's a right time to say that. And I think that's appropriate because people realize that they need something even though they won't admit it. That's the reality that we have to discern. They, they, they need it and we have to be able to see when is the right time to maybe introduce something or talk about something or maybe say something that is a little bit against the grain in their thought process to get them going, to get them thinking about something else outside of that bubble. And guess what that takes? Prayer. Prayer. The only way you're going to be successful at anything in the plan of God is through guidance. God can guide very well, <laughs> very well. But the issue is, do we allow him to guide us? Do we allow him to take the reins and say, this is where you're supposed to go. This is what you're supposed to do. This is where you're supposed to be, right? Uh, many times we don't. So, so here's the, the kind of the start of where Paul was, was moving in, in these verses. And, and that you can understand why he defines all these things. He's got to start with the basics for these guys because they're being pounded with something other than this, these three things right here. Exact opposite. Remember, worship in the flesh, flesh glorify man, and putting confidence in the flesh is what they're being inundated with. Just, just constantly. It's about what you can do. It's about what's in your power. It's about what you can change. It's about what you can be involved in to be a fill in the blank. Right? And that's what is pressuring people today. And you know what? Kids just absorb it. They absorb it. And they say, I, I got this. I got this life by the, by the tail. I, I can do this. No, you can't. You can't do any of it. Actually, you'll fall flat on your face as soon as you get out the door if you lose sight of the Word and God's relationship that He wants to have with you. You, you will lose it. Not lose the relationship, but you will lose your footing in this life when it comes to being detached from the Word. So, and then remember, uh, Paul gets into his, of course, his background. And he names many of the things he used to hang his hat on, which were tradition, heritage, uh, bloodline, 
rank, status, and I would even include wealth in there. And he was actually even proud of his self-discipline when it came to following the things involved in that religious atmosphere. That was something to be proud of. I have done this, this, and this. I have achieved this, this, and this. I have marked all these boxes off. See, there's, we see a lot of that. That positional thing within some religious denomination. There's an accomplished aspect to that that people get very, very, very proud of. Because remember, this is talking about a righteousness that people are trying to gain through their own good works or good deeds, which hope you know by now, that's impossible. But if you're not aware of that, those things that we do can make you very, very proud as, a, as hopefully a believer, right? Because you can shift. Um, but if you don't know, you don't know. And if you're not aware, you're not aware because, like I said, we're getting pounded with just the opposite today in our country. But one day everything changed for, for Paul, as you know. He was on, the, on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus. And God, he had to come to Jesus moment, didn't he? He did. He, a bright light flashed from heaven. I always took that as a lightning maybe, or, or maybe not. It could have just been a light that just was blinding and he fell down. You know, I've always thought and heard that, you know, he fell off his horse. <laughs> and, you know, that, that may be true, because when you think about the distance from Jerusalem to Damascus, it's roughly 135 miles. So you think, well, maybe he was on a horse, hopefully, right? He was on something, riding something. Uh, but the reality is the Scripture doesn't say that. It just says he was struck by light and he fell down. So, and, and what happened? You remember Jesus said, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why are you persecuting me? He asked him the question because remember, Saul was on his way to persecute the Christian church. That's what the, the, how deeply involved in religion that he's, he was, supposedly worshiping the same God that was talking to him with the same rules that the Christians had, with all these same things, but man had taken it and spun it around so much, now he was persecuting the same people that he was really supposed to be worshiping with. And, and Jesus just, you know, that was definitely his calling. He, he was called. I think we're all called. We're not knocked off our, our, off our feet, but some of us are. Some of you are beat up pretty badly by the time you get to the position of being positive. Some of us are tired and open to hear when we get to where Paul was, right? And he was definitely open. He, he was to a place where he, what did he do? He responded. He responded. Okay, if that happened and you didn't respond, I mean, something's got to be wrong with you, right? But you get the idea. People are, are called by God, and it's a response. There's got to be a response. God calls. He draws us to Him, remember? He pulls. He's the one who, who initiates. He loved, you love Him because He loved you first. God is the one who initiates the conversation. He saved you, not because of anything that you did. It's because of he, Him and what He did. He's the initiator, and He initiates in your life as well. But see, People translate those things that happen in their life as just, just bad timing. Just, it just, just one of those things that just happen. No, God is trying to open your eyes to recognize that there's something better. There's a better system. There's a better way to live. There's a better way to do things. And I'm trying to show you that. And the only way to show people that sometimes is just, just knock them off their feet. Knock them off their feet. So look at your kids. Good example. We're no different. We're just bigger. We have just as hard a skulls as the kids have sometimes. We do. So 
So Jesus spoke, and Paul listened, and that was the warning. That was a definite warning and calling, I think, all in one. But, you know, people have the same things, just maybe not so dramatic or in the same way. So the description that Paul was giving us in these verses was about value. It was about value about what he looked to that excited him, about what he looked to that got him going, that uh, uh, you know, got, made him wake up in the morning, that he was excited to get up because of these things. The value had now shifted. It completely changed from what it, they used to be to what his life was centered on now. And remember we talked about this, that should happen for every believer. What is important to you when you first became a believer is not or shouldn't be what's important you, uh, to you today as a believer. Those things should shift. They should change because they're, you know, obviously if you don't know about spiritual things, you don't know how to move or that the priority should even shift. See how it takes the knowledge of constantly learning about, okay, that's better. <laughs> Okay, I learned about this, and that's better. So you place that, you, they keep moving, they keep shifting in your life. This is a constant chess game, by the way. It's constant. Um, and you'll make moves that are wrong. You'll make moves where you didn't see the opponent sitting there waiting to snatch you up because you made a priority shift that wasn't in line with the Word of God and you're just jumping up and kicking your feet together because why? Because you got out of fellowship and now the priorities have shifted. Now the priorities have shifted. But see, the idea is that we continually come back, come back and reshift, refocus, reutilize what God has given us. So don't get upset when things don't happen right now. The priorities are still shifting. Your priorities, are, my priorities are still shifting. We have to come to a place, if the Word of God is important in our life, your life is going to reflect that. It's going to reflect that. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Because why? Because if there's not a reflection, it's not a priority. If there's no application, it's not as much of a, as of a priority as it could be or should be or would be if you had more truth in, the, in your soul. So priorities are constantly shifting. And don't feel bad because Paul, when he was involved with religion all the way to writing the book of Philippians, was a little less than 30 years. 30 year, a little less than 30 years. Think about that. There was a dramatic shift within that time period. He's writing a book of the Bible at this point, the one we're reading. And less than 30 years ago, he was involved, a Pharisee of Pharisees. So don't get distracted too much in the fact that things may not be moving as fast as you'd like. They do move, and they will move. But it does take effort on your part. God doesn't just want you to just be a blob and sit there and do nothing. He wants you to take His Word in, accept it, of course, right? And then take advantage of it. Use it. Apply it. That's a priority shift. And you'll notice that as you go down this road of the Christian life, which is really focusing your priorities around Jesus Christ, by the way, when you move in that direction, you will notice that you become different. You become different. Your thinking changes from the world. And that's the idea. That's the objective, right? We want to think differently from the world because this is Satan's domain. This is his world. He's considered the, the, the power, the king of the earth or the air, right? He's here. This is his area. And, and it's his thinking that's here as well. But we have a different thinking. And you'll notice that when your priority is, is, is Christ, you're the one that's wrong to the world. You're out of line. Your thinking is not right because it's aligned with the Word, with truth. 
and you're the one that's out of place. So prepare, be prepared for some uh, different views, to say it nicely, that are, are different from your views, are opposed to what you think, are not in line with what you may say as, okay, that's right or wrong, right? You would think this would be a good thing. And I'm talking about a good thing to your religious friends. But the more you go down this path, the more that you become the one that's out of, out of line. And it's, it's a hard thing to understand, but the reality of it is when you're constantly in the, in the flesh and you're not learning the truth, you're not going to see eye to eye. You're not going to see eye to eye. You're going to have a disconnect in your thinking with whoever you're around. And I'm not saying that should scare you because we still have to be around people. We've still got to be friends. We've still had to have associates, right? But just be aware of how you come across to people sometimes. You have to be aware that there is a difference in thinking sometimes, right? I mean, you just don't want to just start talking about everything that you, you think or should talk about. There has to be an awareness that comes into your mind that there is a serious disconnect in thinking. Ever brought up politics when you probably shouldn't have? Well, the reason for that is because maybe something you said was aligned with truth. There was, a, there was an alignment with truth and something was, you, you felt like something needed to be said, but notice the retraction from that statement. It's not about politics. It's about what's right. What's spiritually right according to God's word. That's what this is about. This is a, what the entire divisiveness in politics is all about. This is a spiritual issue. You know, it's becoming more and more apparent as we go down this road, as we look at candidates, who are you fighting for? What side of the team are you on? I'm not worried about Democrat, Republican. I'm worried about, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you have values that align with the Bible? If you don't, and you're going to be ruling over our country, guess what? Be prepared for those differences in opinions, differences in what is right and wrong, and, and everything else goes with that. So you can see who's our, where we're at now. Um, and if you don't agree with that, well, it, just, it gives you a snapshot of our country, where the people are. That's all that is. It's what they wanted. It's what they got. Say, so, no, well, the, you know, that was stolen, this and that. You know what? God places kings and rulers in authority, not by accident. Whether it was stolen or not is another issue, right? Maybe it was, but God allowed it to be stolen. That's what happened there. And now we have someone that's in, that is in a line with the spiritual status of the people in the country. So it's a perfect match. Perfect match. There you go. So now you're in a position to make a change. And you know what? There's not very many people like you that are willing to stand up and say something that shouldn't be said, maybe. We're getting to a position where we're going to have to start holding our ground. Right? You see that more and more. Look to the north in Canada. A little more persecution than here. I don't know, I'm hearing stuff <laughs> come around that might drive you nuts again. Got some more, sounds like mandates coming up. I don't know if that's true or not. A redo of all this COVID stuff. <sighs> How about N-O? I mean, you just got to make a stand, right? No. It's that simple. Not going to do it. So you can um, explain to people what Christ did for them, but, or you can even show them sometimes how much he cares and loves them and desires to see them move in the right direction. But if a person is not ready to go there, they're not ready to go there. They're not ready to go there. There has to be something within them, within their life, that causes a change and a positive move in that direction. And I hope it doesn't take something too extreme to make that happen. 
but it may, right? We always think, think that in the back of our mind. I know your thought is, we'll be out of here and then we'll get to enjoy the, the rest of our life because the, the rapture will come, but you never know, right? So, uh, does anyone have the, there we go, I don't, my clock's out up here. So, uh, and another thing that, that Paul said, we've got about a few more minutes on the, this half, is that his background still bothered him sometimes. It still caused a problem every once in a while. It still bubbled up to the surface. That's what he said. Not in those exact words, but that's what he was meaning. He said, yeah, these, I, I really, and you know what, one, one thing about this, he knew where the value was. He understood that, he knew it. But he said it still bubbled up and it would cause a problem because he would revert back to putting confidence in the flesh, which is all those things I just listed. Status, right? All those respect, royalty, all these tradition, bloodline, all these things. He had a, sometimes a tendency to revert back. Now, I will tell you that this is true when it comes to people and your religious background. It will continue to cause, not necessarily problems, but it will continue to bubble up and you will find yourself comparing it against what the Word of God says. Comparing a man-centered and created denomination against what the Word of Truth says. You will find yourself in that position. You know what, I'm not used to that, that's not what I know, that's not what I'm used to. But that's the point why Paul is bringing it up. So we're aware of the problems that something so long ago can still be in our life. Because if anyone shouldn't have a problem, it's Paul. But he, he does. He says it still comes up. And I think the only way you can deal with this problem, because it's going to affect you, is through the consistency in your study of the Word. That's it. That's the only thing. If you're going to be molded into something that God wants you to be, you've got to maintain that consistency in His Word. Because guess what's pounding at your door when you walk out of here? The world. It's going to mold you in the opposite direction. That's part of what being a Christian is, is being set apart for God's purposes. We're not just placed in the thousands of denominations and, and being set apart. No, you're being set apart for God's purposes, for Christ. That's what a Christian's all about. And, and part of that means that you're being molded to be like Christ, Christ-like, and think like Him, which is completely different than anything that we think now or that your flesh thinks, your sin nature. It's completely different. So we've got to deal with that. We've got to know how to handle it, catch it when we see it coming, and, and counter it. And the only way to do that is to consistently receive truth. That's it. Consistently. So consistency is good. Don't ever let anyone tell you that consistency is not good because religion has taught that when the church is open, is all you need. That, that's it. When the doors of the, of the church open and if you're there every time, that's all you need. That's consistency. No, it's not. Because guess what? Churches aren't open but two or three days a week. That's not enough. That, that is not enough. Actually, that's not even ha over half the week sometimes. In some cases, in some churches, look at ours. It's two days. That's only three lessons. Three lessons. If you want a lesson a day, there's only three days. Actually, you got two today, so you, this is one day. So two days, you got lessons. Now you have something to do with the other five. So no, showing up to church every time when the doors open and hearing the word is not enough. It's not enough. And it's not something to be proud of to say I was there every time the doors opened. If that's all you did. <laughs> Because there's a lot more that, that has to happen. So hopefully what Paul 
happen to Paul, the priority shifting is going to happen to us. And what changes in your mind is things, like I said, that are man-centered. So, um, and, and this is, I think, what every pastor waits patiently on. For the congregation's priorities to shift. And we do wait patiently. We have to wait patiently. Right? That, that's what our job is, is to teach and to wait. Hopefully, we see a change. I mean, I, you know, it would drive a pastor insane if he would constantly teach, 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 and there would be absolutely no change in the people. No priority shifting. Lots of clicks, lots of, you know, all this and that in the church, and all of a sudden church rifts and no change at all. Man, that would drive pastors crazy. And that's why you see so many pastors shifting around. They shift, they got to get out of that church. They got to go two, three years, they're out of there. They need a new, they're tired of the pastor, he's tired of them, and they need to go and he has, they want a new pastor. Why? Because there's no mind, there's no change in the heart. So you got to shift them out of there and get a new one, get some more entertainment that's new, fresh, fresh blood, right? And then you'll get tired of him, and then he's out of there too. No change of mind. So there's got to be a change, and that, that is a process. So this is, a, I think, a good place to, to stop here, and then we'll come back, and we'll keep going in this lesson, but remember our, our communion services after the second half of the second service. So let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the, uh, just the ability to see the truth, to see that there's things here that we consistently need to hear. And if we don't hear them, we forget them. And if we forget them, we're going to think differently and live in a way that is not glorifying to you and is not spirit-filled. And we just thank you so much for the, the reality of the word to check us. Uh, we thank you all for, for all these things. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.